Welcome everybody to the March 9th, 2020 UGA business meeting. Um, is there any new members here that haven't been introduced? Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of announcements. AEG, pardon? You said business meeting. Yeah, this is the business portion of the meeting. These are just the announcements from what happened. So um, let's see, back to announcements. AEG has a meeting um, on Thursday, the 12th. Jeff Moore from the University of Utah will do a tour of Utah Rock Avalanches. It's up at Red Robin. It's a, gonna be a pretty good meeting, it usually is. SME has not filled me in. Um, I have reached out to the program chair and the president, and I do not know if they usually have their meeting on the same time on, which is the second Thursday of the month, but they have not announced their meeting so far this week. But the biggest meeting this month is gonna be AWG on 328-2020, the silent auction will be headed at, um, it's at a new facility at 975 Southwest Temple in Salt Lake. I don't see Lucy here or any other member from AWG, but it's a really good time. It's well worth it. Um, to me, it's kind of like the geo event of the year. It's, it is. They probably are still taking donations if you're interested and talk to Lucy Jordan about it if they are. Next thing on our agenda from our business meeting is we decided this year on our field camp scholarships, we had a hard time saying no to anybody. So what we did is we kind of came up with a system and we said, we've been spending a lot of money and so we're cutting back and what we did is we set a limit of $10,000 this year. And what we did is we said there's gonna be two different groups and the top performers will get $900 and the rest of the group will get $500 for their efforts of submitting a scholarship. So everyone that submitted for a scholarship has received. We asked, basically what we did is we asked every institution to give us two nominees. And basically, so with the aid of the professor's recommendations, we've given two scholarships per each school. But the there's two different numbers that they could receive. But we couldn't say no to anybody. It's kind of what it boiled down to. And we thought that instead of giving one person more money and then nobody not getting anything, so one person or X amount of people in the group will get 500 and X amount of people will get 900. Seven and seven. Yeah, seven, seven people will get 900 and seven people will get 500. That makes sense. So each university is participating. So we're trying to spread the love around and include everybody that, that wanted to be involved in the scholarship program. So um, it was a decision by the board. I like the decision. I support that that decision was made this year because sometimes some students don't get anything. So next on the list is President-elect Riley has chosen his presentation. I'm going to let him come up. So uh, I'm oily. I work uh, in the oil and gas. So. But first I'm going to present him with, because I received this as president-elect, and so I'm going to pass it on to him so he can pass it on to the next one. But this was a piece of rock from the Park City Sunrise Sunrise Rotary Park, so it's his to give on. And we're excited for next year will be one of you. Um, I can't wait to give this to you next year. <laughs> so uh, keep in mind. All right, so we uh, thought carefully about what we could do as a good guidebook that would have a wide appeal, that we could uh, get good participation on, uh, lots of paper submissions, and then would sell well. We, uh, you know, we, we want to sell a lot of books. We're going with the uh, Green River um, formation, both uh, its current uh, research uh, into the climate, stratigraphy. Um, Mike Vandenberg's going to be the uh, chief uh, uh, editor on it, um, and then we got a whole slew of people uh, helping to edit on it, uh, Elliot among them. 
Um, if you're doing anything work that's related to uh, stuff in the Uinta Basin, Green River particularly, um, please think of uh, submitting a paper and, uh, and look out for it next year. We'll have a great field trip associated with it, and it'll be a good guidebook. Thanks. Okay, next on the agenda is we did do a survey monkey on the UGA delegate for the AAPG delegate for the next three years. And Dave Waverick is the one that has been chosen the delegate by all the boarding, by the voting. Next on my list is fundraising. We're still trying to raise money. We haven't gotten any official submissions for advertising in our newsletter. Is there information on the website as far as what you're charging for advertising and sizes and that kind of stuff? There is in the newsletter. I, it was part of my president's message this month in the newsletter and we did add in an additional one which is if you just have a business card $50 a year would get it for you all year long. And in addition to being in our newsletter every month, you would also be on the website. So it's kind of a, a double bang. And, and really, it's reaching over 700 people a month between the newsletter and the website. So I think it's a pretty good bang for your buck. Um, I would like to encourage everybody to sign up more for the annual, if they can. And if anybody knows, a service company, drilling oh. company... Yeah, I, I am aware. I think I woke up to $27 a barrel. <laughs> That's, it was its low. That I think it's back up to 32 but, you know, it was 27 so. All the selling for $10 less than that. Is it? Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yep, so, so maybe somebody. Oil, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the really good thing about. In the commodities business, when oil is down, gold goes up. So if you know any people that drill for gold, the gold price is up. <laughs> so consider if you, you, if you know any drilling companies, anybody that wants to advertise their business with us. Consultants. I have quite a few consultants that would probably like to, to put in a business card. So, um, and we do have PayPal set up. Adam? Do we still have T-shirts from two years ago? Yes. And that is on my last part of that, on the T-shirts. Um, they've been kind of checked out to the bookstore. So we have them. They're over at the bookstore. And if you want to buy them, go over to the bookstore, and then we will get reimbursed as UGA. Cool. Paul, do we know, like, do we have polos still or T-shirts? The bookstores keep an inventory now. Yeah. Well, Adam, your name was brought up because I was, I asked, <laughs> you know, because I'm now been thrust into this fundraising mode because of the AAPG situation. And so I said, well, maybe I'll do a fall t shirt. And I said, did we make any money? And it's kind of like we kind of broke even because I was kind of coming up with, I thought it would be cool to have a long sleeve t shirt, utahgeology.org, put our website down it and just, the printed logo but if you want to set something like up that something like that up i'm happy to arrange it for you but i think you know pricing and figuring out how our last one did is kind of yeah <laughs> well I'll, I'll get with if, if anybody would just give me a show of hands how many people would buy another t-shirt if it was out maybe a long sleeve t-shirt so Maybe we'll price them a little higher, but we still want you to buy them. But it's for the scholarship program, guys. Um, anyway, I guess we're done with the business part of the meeting, and we're going to move on to Paul introducing our speaker.
Okay, uh, today we are lucky to have Christian Hardwick, uh, the resident geophysicist here at the Utah Geological Survey and a senior geologist. Um, he's been here since 2011, received his BS and MS from the U of U, and um, has done a number of important uh, geophysical things here in Utah, uh, including um, uh, surveying of gravity throughout the state. So uh, before uh, being a geologist here, he was a journeyman carpenter at, in McMurdo, Antarctica, which I think is pretty cool. Didn't you get to build the steps for Edmund Hillary or something like that? I did. <laughs> Which is, that's a Sir, neat. They were called the Sir Ed Memorial Steps. <laughs> so, so he could walk up into his Antarctica he had hut. Fallen, yeah, he had fallen down some steps and it didn't have a handrail at one of the field sites, so then we had to build a handrail. So. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. That's not in here, but I figured that was nice. OK, so uh, please welcome uh, Christian Hardwick. Yes, yeah, so because we're streaming, you can interact too. Is that okay? Yeah. Easier up here. Not sure you guys had a uh, podium last time I was here. This feels more official. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so I was invited to come and speak about the. Uh, all the drone kind of work that we've been doing at UGS for the last couple of years. Um, this is not gonna be a super technical talk. And anything that's sort of hazards related, I'll defer that to the hazards guy, who or guys, most of them are on that table right there. <laughs> but everything else, uh, you'll be able to see sort of what we've been doing and how we've been applying these things. All right, so brief outline. Um, I'll go through sort of what the SUAS program is, and then we've got examples, uh, hazards, uh, geology, geologic mapping, and some biological co-op studies that we worked on that were pretty interesting. Okay, first and foremost. This is me kind of testing to see sort of uh, what kind of audience I have here. It's like you guys are pretty receptive, paying attention so far. Um, <clears throat> so we had set out originally with this UAS working group, and that's based inside of DNR, all seven divisions. Essentially, we had a bunch of pilots in different groups scattered about. We wanted to bring them all together to make sure that we had a good policy in place in case we have some sort of an incident that we know that our butts are covered in DNR to show. We have the qualifi qualifications to do this work. We were doing things that we were supposed to be and not somewhere we weren't supposed to be. Um, yeah. Okay. So, what is an SUAS? Small Unmanned Aerial System. Some kind of like to use the word drone. I kind of feel like it's got that sort of a, a negative kind of, you know, <laughs> this over here. Um, negative feeling to it. So, we use SUAS. Even though it's kind of a mouthful, it doesn't have that negative stigma to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, to some it does. But <laughs> okay, so about a year ago, we finally put in place the policy for the SUAS program at DNR. Um, we are self-regulating, and so we, you know, we have representatives from each of the divisions that sit in on this this board essentially to determine what policies will be and how we want to sort of guide this program going forward. Um, and being that. You know, we didn't want to have a bunch of misfit pilots and different divisions kind of running around and not using the same sort of uh, guidelines. This is why we all kind of came together. As far as, you know, UGS is, is concerned, um, you can see down on the bottom benefits. I mean, this applies to the other programs, but primarily the safety for staff. Um, a lot of that is, you know, comes into play with the geologic hazard assessments. You can only see so much from the ground, and when the staff is out there, they might be getting close to the edge of, say, you know, a head scarp of a significant landslide. They could be at the toe and not know what's above them. Um, so this is just a really good tool to go out and even do these preliminary assessments or even reconnaissance missions. Um, 
they're also really easy to, uh, to set up and get out and get moving. Okay, various uses of drones. So what UGS has been doing, um, part of that is inclusive here, but there's a whole slew of things you can do. Uh, most of the things we work on would be uh, high resolution ortho mosaics and 3D models. Um, out of that, you get the geologic maps. Um, there's also mineral resources, thermal mapping. Uh, Dogum has done a fair amount of thermal mapping with their fancy drone. We get in on that and kind of going towards the future, you've got uh, these magnetometer, especially these LIDAR systems that are getting really cheap and portable. So look for a big change or shift in the future towards drone-based LIDAR. Other uses of drones, Let's see who else is still awake after all that heavy pizza. Okay. So, and that's right, Mark. I did say drones instead of S-U-A-S, right? <laughs> okay, so usage types, I kind of split this into two categories. It seems to be the main sort of bins that we've been using it. First one would be reconnaissance. So if you need to fly out, you know, an area that either you well, first of all, you don't know much about, maybe there's some sort of a factor of, of uh, safety involved in there. Um, you can deploy it, go out, check and see what you've got, and then you can come up with a plan and, and determine where to go from there. And then on the right-hand side, there's data collection. This is after you've come up with your plan, you figured out what you wanna do and sort of what your final product uh, is going to be. Okay, so first example. This was uh, up in Tanner, Tanner's Gulch just last year, and you can see Hazard Geologist for Scale here. This is Ben in the back corner, if you haven't met him. Um, Rich Durow up on the top. This was one of the uh, one of the events that they responded to. Um, in fact, I've got some more photos. Let me jump to this next spot. So Tanner's Gulch, you can see first two images. Those are from uh, satellite uh, data, and you can see the a nice kind of gulch with rocks filling it down. 2000, 2011, 2014, and then 2019, that is actually a, um, that's a 3D model or a high-res ortho mosaic that was created from the data that we collected from one of our SUAS. Now, when you're on the ground, it's kind of hard to see what's there or really recognize, you know, what's been moved, what mass kind of changes you've, uh, has occurred in the area. There's a couple more photos. There's an older, you know, 2013 and then 2019. You can see some changes between the two, particularly this pile of rocks here. And for scale, there's another hazard geologist right there. That's Adam. Now, kind of the the powerful part of the tool is what can we do with this? How can we figure out, you know, what's happened, what's changed with these different events? So this is a differencing that Ben had put together looking at the mass or the, the volume changes, not the mass changes, from the earlier LIDAR data, which I believe was 2016. Yeah, 2016 LIDAR data to the, basically the drone data, or SUAS data, when he flew it in 2019. And if you need kind of a point of reference, I've got the boulder marked on the difference from the left-hand side, and then you've got the aerial image on the right-hand side. So you can see that this is all new volume right here. My mouse is stuck. Okay. One of the other things we can do, um, we can look at sort of, you know, the the changes in a profile transect. And with LiDAR, you don't have as high of resolution. And so you can see that, you know, on the left-hand side, that would be earlier data versus right-hand side where you've got higher resolution with the uh, SUAS data and those models that were created from it. And then here's a nice sort of overview of the two um, with the model on the right-hand side and then the ortho mosaic on the left-hand side. And again, I'm not interpreting any of this stuff. I'm just kind of showing what they've done. All right, next example. This is up in uh, Morgan County Waste Dump, which is Trapper's Loop, um, right next or next door to Snow Basin. 
another one of the models that we created. This was actually, uh, let's see, the ortho mosaic and the 3D terrain model. Um, this took about 25 minutes of flight time to collect the data. Um, that was about 481 photos acquired and approximately two hours of computer processing time. So this is pretty quick to, you know, if you get a phone call in the morning, say, hey, this landslide is moving, which the hazards guys do get a lot of those kinds of phone calls that they need to get out and collect that data. This is a quick turnaround time. This is less than a day that you can actually look and see what those changes are. The other nice thing, especially the waste dump and some of the other surveys, you can go out and do uh, exact position reoccupations. And so you can compare sort of the larger model using your, uh, your ground control points and markers that they put in in the past that are high precision. All right, Spring Creek. Uh, I don't know if many of you heard about this one, but it was, it was a pretty big deal, especially for the residents up in the neighborhood on the top of that hill. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I should preference. If any of you get kind of queasy with landslides, and you might want to close your eyes for this one. <laughs> so this is the backyard of, obviously, backyard of an unfortunate homeowner at the, the, at the head scarp. And if this one doesn't make you feel uneasy, watch the, uh, that little swing set and slide. Oh. And there's, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is important stuff. And I think there were issues originally in trying to get permission to access the land of this house and in the neighborhood is the owner just didn't want, you know, our uh, wanted UGS hazard geologists. They're surveying, they didn't want them to do their job to assess this, this problem. And here I've actually got a video that I'll show you. No sound here. Um, didn't have any cool, eerie theme music that we could put to it, or nor did I have the time to do that. But this is this is one of those sort of the powerful uses with an SUAS or a drone is you can get this nice bird's eye view of the area before you go into it. So staff can see, you know, do we want to be at the bottom of this? Is there anything unstable up high? You know, you can do an assessment of this area. You can let's see if I've got a mouse. Down through here, you see these dark areas. They look like they're saturated material. Um, maybe that's not a place, you know, perhaps this is still active. Um, again, I'll defer to the hazards geologist for any, you know, technical questions. And again, you're not gonna be able to see all of this standing at the top or at the bottom, they're just First of all, it's just not safe. Did you have to process that? I mean, that seems like a really stable for being in the air. Yeah, so this, well, part of it, so these are clips from, basically clips that are stitched together from different video sections. So it's shortened, I think this is a minute and a half in total. Um, when we're doing the recon stuff, we'll record the whole thing so you could have a five minute, 10 minute video, which is actually really boring to watch until there's interesting stuff like this. So, um, but this was all the same flight. <laughs> all right, and this would be a product from this specific, uh, specific work. So you can see there's a nice uh, landslide map here um, showing the different events, different stages. This is something that I believe is still actively monitored. Is that right, Ben? Yeah. Yeah. So you'd be able to do 
a fair amount of this from the ground, but being able to get that bird's eye view makes it so much simpler. Okay, anyone that lives around Salt Lake City probably knows about this one pretty well, um, the Parkway Drive landslide. These are a couple of nice drone shots from Adam. This is the, I'm gonna get this right, it's a textured mesh. So this is a 3D model that you're looking at here. And in fact, I was gonna put on the, the 3D model and rotate it around, but it's kind of a pain and probably really bogged down this computer to do it. Um, so we'll just look at the steel here. You can see this is a significant issue, especially for these, you know, the house at the top, but primarily the ones down at the bottom. In fact, one of them is already removed, I believe. And I should also, I should also say that this data was not collected by UGS. This was collected by BYU. So what can we do with it? Similar to Little Cottonwood Canyon with Tanner's Gulch, we can look at the older LiDAR data, compare that to the new uh, 3D data or 3D models, and then start looking at those differences. And I think here it's pretty striking. Uh, I like to point out down on the bottom lower right, you can see you've got one of those homes has been removed. It looks like one has been added since, well, that would go back to the 2014 LiDAR, so. All right, high profile one. This is really cool. Everybody loves Zion, hearing anything about Zion. Um, there were some good videos. Uh, just by happenstance, someone was there when it was, when the uh, rock avalanche was coming down. I'm not gonna show that though, sorry. I will show you the aftermath. So you can see the top two photos. This is all the debris and material that has filled in that trail. And I think it's pretty easy to see what, what, is, what was there uh, or what's there now that wasn't there before, kind of the light sand. And then down on the bottom, that's our latest drone after we had to upgrade from our past one. Um, it had a unfortunate, uh, what do we call it? Crash. <laughs> no. Well. Call it unplanned, unplanned landing. That's it. <laughs> to, to no fault of the pilot and looking at the logs, there was no errors that we could see and, and really no explanation. So, which is also good that we have this policy to say, all right, our pilot was where he was supposed to be, following protocol, doing what he needs to do. In case there was an incident, if it fell on a person, fell on a car, whatever, we know that he was covered and then we're covered. One of the products from Zion, um, this is actually a ortho mosaic of the cliff face. So they took photos up and down, side to side, flying with a drone, stitched it all together. And then if you look on here, um, this is in the report, it explains a lot better. Um, basically these are the fracture, um, all the fracture networks on that, the face. Let me see if this pointer works still. Kind of I believe this is where actually right up here, I think that's the fresh surface. So that's where the rock, the big rock fell and kind of started that rock avalanche. So there's another product. This is looking at differencing from existing LiDAR to the new 3D models that we created with SUAS. Uh, this is also the handiwork of Ben. Thanks for that, Ben. So you can see all the material that is, that is here. Um, I just think this is, this is really impressive. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we've been able to do um, and so quickly has, I mean, it's really kind of mind blowing, I think. Bless you. All right, another high profile one. This was, I believe, August of 2019. Round Peak is down near uh, Springville in Utah County. That boulder all the way over on the right, that's sort of the, uh, that's the main focus of this. And you can see its footprints in the, the two left photos there. <laughs> and what bounce marks, I like footprints. Yeah. This was close. I mean, it, it was essentially knocking on their front door, right? This, <laughs> oh, 
what's even more amazing is the path that this boulder took to get there. And I'll show you that in just a moment. So you get a phone call, people asking how did this, you know, there's a boulder on my front porch or <laughs> on the neighbor's front porch, how did it get here? You know, are there more gonna be coming down? These are the sort of things that our hazards guys have to deal with and do a quick deployment, get out there and try and figure out if there's more, you know, if there's gonna be more uh, risk or high risk in the area. This is the view from one of the neighbor's backyards that backs up to the mountainside. So this is looking eastward. Can't really pick it out in this photo. Um, but right through here, I'll kind of trace the path. Oh, sorry, over one. The polar came through here and somewhere up here. You could actually see the footprints or the bounce marks from his backyard in a nice linear path up the, the middle part of the mountain. He was actually in his backyard watching it come down along with two, his two other neighbors. And they were all thinking, okay, it's coming towards me. Took a turn, at least for this guy, he was fortunate. The other two, it turned towards them and they ran inside. And by the time they'd gone inside, the boulder had passed by them. But I mean, can you just imagine looking up from your backyard and you see this boulder just kind of bouncing? And I mean, it's, it's kind of impact points. Some of them are more than 100 feet apart. So, I mean, this thing was really hauling. This was essentially the source. Ben had hiked up and tracked it down. I'd helped him do a little bit of the recon, but really to figure out what was there, you had to get a geologist up there. Let's see if he's still got, ah, he still has animations on the slide. So source point, some other uh, toppled uh, formation from that boulder. Maybe it all tumbled at the same time but then you've just got the main boulder that continued on down. And here's a cool, well, sort of a video, more of a composite. So this is drone video for the first part, <clears throat> excuse me. And then afterwards, this is the 3D model and then the rock path you can see traced down in the red. Here it bounces over a cliff. <laughs> it's one of the footprints or impact craters. Uh, they were huge. See it plowed right through the trees, so it was easy to find lower down where there were trees. One piece of the rock stopped, smaller piece. The other one actually was side hilling back there. And I don't know if you noticed that it went right between the houses. A little bit of English right up on the front porch. I mean it's, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, question of how did this happen? I mean, a, a little bit of luck that it went between those houses and not through them, but there was no way that you could get out of the way of this thing. Didn't it bounce over the road? It did bounce, yeah, so there was one gouge in the gutter on one side and it bounced over and then hit the concrete curb on the other side and then kind of rolled up onto the yeah, couldn't, couldn't have laid up a golf shot any better. <laughs> well, it, another funny thing is that the owner, we had talked to the owner of the house and they were surprised and obviously, but you know, they'd kind of gotten over it. They just wanted to get rid of it because everybody was coming by to take photos. This is the boulder that came down. This is the house and they're like, well, you know, you could just roll it over into the yard and now you've got some sort of a, you know, maybe a protection feature sitting there now. Um, but they didn't want anything to do with that. They wanted to get rid of it. And so it was a whole ordeal to bring in a truck to crane it up and get it out of there.
this I thought was, was really cool. So someone else had picked this up and wanted to use the models that Ben put together to do essentially probabilities of where this boulder could have tumbled or if another one comes down, where could it end up? Um, so I'll just let you kind of digest that for a bit. The other thing is if you look at the aerial, aerial photos, even some of our drone stuff or satellite imagery, you look, oh, my pointer is dead now. Over to the lower right, right hand side, there's actually a lot of boulders sitting there. Same size as the one that rolled up on the porch, some of them even bigger. So I mean, you can see that this is an area that's prone to these boulders coming down. This is not something that's new. It's new that people were there when it happened, but. <laughs> And I like this too. Okay, next site that we use this at, uh, down near, just outside of Millard, um, not Millard, Milford, Utah, um, is the Utah Forge site. This is a DOD, DOE project that we've been working on. I've been personally involved for, I don't know, maybe the last four or five years. Um, and it's kind of tapered off now, but uh, we won't, dig into all the details. We'll just kind of show what we've used the drone there. Um, this is the main pad or the drilling site for this forge project. So this is EGS, it's enhanced geothermal system or an engineered geothermal system. So hot, dry rock, crystalline basement. We wanted to see sort of how close the earthworks were to the original survey points and to see how far out, you know, these berms are going, if they're contained, if everything looks good according to, um, according to the uh, NEPA docs that were submitted. So you can see the model left-hand side and the pad on the right-hand side. Obviously, these were that picture was not taken at the same time that the model was done. There were fewer trucks on the pad. In fact, I believe both of those trucks are UGS trucks. So just another use, 3D models. Now we jump over to Lakeside, which is just on the other side of the causeway going across the Great Salt Lake. Um, this was back in 2018. Another high resolution ortho mosaic, and then the 3D model. This is more sort of testing the uh, kind of the constraints on the vertical precision of this 3D modeling. Um, sometimes we would test without using ground control points, and we would put them in and see what those differences are. Uh, this particular project was focused on mapping um, large scale. Uh, travertine and tufa, uh, tufa mounds or micro microbial lights. Uh, a couple of specs from this particular survey. Let's see, 60 minutes flight time, uh, 1,200 photos, four hours to process. So, I mean, basically it was a half day to go out, collect the data, come back, push it in the computer. If you didn't want to hang around too late in the office, just come back the next morning, pull it up. There you go. Good to go. This was probably the largest area that we surveyed down at Mona Reservoir. This is a project I worked on with Paul Inkebrat um, with groundwater study. Oh, and we've got a nice video for this one. I think that title said mono, but this is Mona. <laughs> so sort of part of the project and sort of really the urgency to go out and see if we could create a 3D model was the fact that the reservoir was so low that you could, if you can get a good 3D model, we could create a nice bathymetry, three-dimensional model of the reservoir. And then from there, you can sort out basically what whatever level or elevation the water is at, you know how much volume is in the reservoir. And this is not a small reservoir. I think the section we surveyed was a mile wide and about almost five miles long. I mean, you, well, you wouldn't have been able to, but say if it was going to stay low for an extended amount of time, you could do a contract with a LIDAR company, but then you're waiting, you know, who knows, 
six months, you know, three or four months to acquisition and possibly up to a year before you get that data back. How many flights was that? Processing didn't wasn't proportional though, so it didn't require much more processing in these smaller areas. Yeah, and we had to mess computing cost for it. So I've got a couple of specs for this one. So three and a half hours of flight time to collect the data. It was almost four thousand photos, and processing time. Paul's best estimates were somewhere around eighteen to twenty hours to run it, and this is a mile wide, five miles long almost. So. Here's the output you've got on the far left hand side. That is the whole reservoir and uh, that's the high resolution ortho mosaic. That red box you see is sort of that middle panel zoomed in and then also the 3D model on the far right of that same area. And then the top right corner is the, it's not, it's a hypsometer. Yeah, hypsometric yeah, hip curve, which is the, what I was explaining earlier, right? That's the water level versus volume of the reservoir. So Paul was able to do that based off of the uh, SUAS data we collected for this project. All right, switching over to, well, not the bio stuff, but something that kept Elliot busy for maybe a good month and a half, two months. So the mic, yeah, Marablite, <laughs> he loves this stuff, guys, if you see it. Track them down if you think you see a mount. <laughs> so these were the original discoveries. There was a, a, a newer park ranger at the Great Salt Lake Marina that had started to kind of take an interest to these mounds and noticed that they weren't typical you know, salt formations that you find around the Great Salt Lake. Um, so Elliot ran out there, took a look at them, determined that they were not you know, halite or any other type, and then we just sort of started building off of that. So aside from, you know, that nice overview photo of doing some recon, we can also get some close-up shots, but from above, so that it makes it a lot easier for us to measure kind of the size of these features, particularly the larger ones. So you can see there's a field notebook, that yellow book, um, that's approximately, oh, I'd say about eight inches wide, 10 inches tall. Um, you can use that for scale. These are the four mounds that are at the Great Salt Lake Marina. Another site we went out to, this is Antelope Island. Um, and further out, we had been, they had been tipped off for you know, these particular mounds by a couple of photographers that were out there and had seen these things and thought they looked interesting. Cool. There's a shot from above. <clears throat> if you look down about the center of the photo, down to the left, that's Elliot for scale from above. This thing's huge. And in fact, the notebook, you can barely see that notebook on there. Laser pointer right there, that's the yellow notebook. So I mean, and the other thing that was striking about this one is you can see sort of those emerald greens, you know, those green colors, um, it was really beautiful. And I think these pools were also pretty deep as well, like a meter or more. So you wouldn't wanna start walking on this and fall into one of them. At, wouldn't be a happy camper. So recon, you know, with the SUAS, we don't have to hike all the way out to a spot just to check it out. These were a couple of features that we were curious whether or not they were these Mirabolite mounds. And this is also kind of out in that Antelope Island area. Upon closer inspection, they do not look like Mirabolite mounds. They look more like ice plates that are just sort of uh, you know, they're imbricated, but piling up based on whatever direction the wind is blowing and kind of breaking off of the lake. Here's another view. The other thing that's interesting is if you look sort of back into the right, it's got a, there's a track. Uh, we don't think, I don't think that this is the actual mound moving. It's the opposite. It's the ice on top of the lake that's moving, causing that trail. All right, now we shift up to Razel Point, um, the tar seeps. I think some of you might be familiar with those. They're actually pretty close to Spiral Jetty. 
So this was a project that we're helping out uh, Westminster College and uh, Bonnie Baxter with the Great Salt Lake Institute. Um, they're studying the pelicans. So these are remnants of pelicans, um, to put it nicely. The ones that got stuck um, in some of these natural seeps and the bigger one, which I'll show an image of, um, they were just curious to see sort of what the mortality rate is, how many pelicans are being stuck there, and kind of what's going on with, uh, with that system. So here's a larger shot. Image on the right is a photo, a single photo with the, uh, oh, sorry, actually that is the ortho mosaic, high resolution ortho mosaic. Left hand side is a single photo with the drone. You can see all the little white specks that are on there, those are pelicans. So in this, this particular one, there's somewhere around 26 to 30 pelicans that are on there that you can see that still have feathers. You know, there was an episode back in the late 90s where uh, more pelicans than that ended up dead up at Rizal Point, and the EPA actually came in and investigated it, and that, that was sort of the uh, impetus for trying to plug those. To start cleaning. The wells yep. were there, yeah. Yeah, that was, you showed me a picture of the, original was that 2004 no, this was way before that no because they'd gone out and cleaned up, clean up oh, oh. yeah around that yeah. yeah when they went in and so there's been work out here a few times looking at this and it really sort of the cycle coincides with the lake when the lake is up you don't get any of these deposits because they're just washed away and then when the lake level goes back down you get it and you probably get a new kind of trigger of this episode with the biology and everything else um, it's really interesting um, for scale from north to south, the length of this larger seep is about 80 meters. So about 200 feet. Okay, last part. Um, this was working with forestry fire and state lands. Um, this was specifically for uh, working on the invasive species Phragmitis um, and the, uh, slips of mind, the control of it up there. So this was a project using a fixed wing, um, just because that's what Forestry and Fire had. They wanted it. They wanted someone that had some, you know, uh, experience with it to see if we could outfit it with a multispectral camera, and then go out and fly these fields. And essentially, that data would then be used, kicked back to a contractor to look at where they need to spray, where it was missed the previous year, and then what's going to happen in the future. Um, their equipment, as it stands, does have GPS tracking on it, so they're, they can be fully autonomous, along with the sprayer nozzles, is they can turn off and on um, as they go. So essentially, they want to make the whole thing autonomous for the spraying. The um, it's about a meter. So in order to do this, we, I had to take the flight controller, original flight controller out of it, retrofit it. Um, with a number of different things, uh, just so it would fly well, uh, because the flight controller was sort of an all-in-one. And if you notice up in that right-hand corner, there's that hook. I'll explain what that's for in a minute. So basically, it was gutted, rebuilt. Only the airframe was reused for this. So flight test, we had to basically make sure that the center of gravity was back to where it needed to be so that you'd have the same characteristics in flying. Um, so you've got that stability. The other thing is that the multi-spectral camera cost about six grand. We don't want this thing to go down and lose it. So the photo on the right hand side, that's actually the landing net. Um, when you're working up in Farmington Bay, the only axis that you've got are these dikes between it. So if the wind is not blowing the direction along the dike, you're not going to be able to land this because this does land by crashing and it land and it launches by throwing. So you need something to catch it. This is what the final uh, the final build looks like. Then in final testing, we did add a, a dual purpose um, transmitter and beacon on this unit, so that if it does lose power and go down, you can go out and find it. Uh, which is nice in areas where you don't have, you know, 4G, 3G, any sort of mobile data to track it down and get it. Um, also, we didn't want to lose $6,000. I personally didn't want to be responsible for <laughs> dropping it in the lake. 
So this is sort of our test case where we were working, Howard Slew um, in Farmington Bay. Now, lower left-hand side, that's, those are the different zones that we were testing. Each of them are about 100 acres apiece. Here's one of the dikes, as I was talking about. This is our landing zone. If you don't have that net, there's really not a good way to land it without going into the water. Some people will catch it, but adding that extra mass on there, it's just not really a good idea. <laughs> the original one, you can, it's a lot lighter. So here are some of the outputs. Uh, these are four different zones that we flew last, uh, at the end of last summer. And these will get pushed on actually to the University of Utah group um, with that, the NDVI that's over on that far hand side that has to do with the vegetation. They'll use that to create the maps and then send that to the contractor so then they know exactly what to program into their sprayers and their tractors. And a couple kind of, couple of notes. Um, I think maybe the most important one, we could fly anywhere from 100 to 150 acres with this fixed wing, and you're pushing about 100 acres in 15 minutes. Now, one of those zones, we did fly with a quadcopter, and it took over an hour to fly with a quadcopter. So you really speed up your efficiency with these fixed wings. Okay, to summarize, um, basically, SUAS systems, uh, I mean, they're giving us these three major benefits. Um, first one is safety to staff. Um, second one, you get a quick assessment. And then the rapid deployment as the third one there. Um, going forward, there's a lot of technology that's, that's emerging in more compact uh, forms that you'd be able to incorporate to either fixed wings or quadcopters. And so really, if you're looking at smaller areas, you know, SUAS is sort of the way to go for these aerial surveys. If you need to do something bigger, you know, you might need to hire a contractor, a small Cessna, Cessna outfit, something along those lines. And that's all. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? I have a question about the processing of LIDAR data. Oh, you had said you brought that back to the office. Laptops are really powerful. Mm -hmm. Can suitably be processing in the field. It's a very long, long process. process. Yeah. So Steve asked if we'd be able to process the data in the field. If you have a powerful enough laptop or maybe a workstation, you could. It also depends on how large the data set is that you've covered. So the Mona stuff, we wouldn't be able to. Um, for the smaller, you know, the waste dump landslide, something that's a bit more manageable, you could do that in the field, and. And just keep going. Maybe while your batteries are recharging, you could process a chunk of that data and then continue on. Is there any difference between the resolution of the quadcopters versus the fixed wing? Yeah. So if we go back, I skipped over it. Yeah. So you go back and look at this um, in particular. So. The resolution of the multi-spectral cam is not as good as a quadcopter. And typically, you know, there's sort of an area where you have a play between data resolution and optimization of your survey. How long do we want to be in the air? You know, how much battery do we have left? How far can we go on a single battery? And for these in particular, we actually would like to fly higher to get the sampling that makes the most sense for kind of the end product. So we would actually want to be flying at about 1,000 feet based on the field of view for the multi-spec camera. So this is really high-resolution data for, uh, for its end purpose. But comparing the, say, the uh, DJI uh, Mavic 2 Pro to the multi-spectral cam, um, you're looking at, I think, about 8 megapixels to 21 or 24 megapixels on the camera. The other thing that's nice about the quadcopters is you can stop and pause in the mission to take the photo, as opposed to fixed wing, you always have to keep moving. So for now, quadcopters kind of, you can get the better sensors on them, but they're not going to be as efficient if you have to fly a larger area, um, or you need to spend a lot more money on a fixed wing or VTOL or something like that. What were the hooks for on the fixed wing? <laughs> oh, I, had a, I had a short video that the U student uh, Do they like, get caught in the net so it doesn't fall? They do get caught in the net. So that the, 
so that the uh, fixed wing doesn't fall back down onto the ground and, and damage things. Um, we could have planned the video better. I didn't even know he was recording it, but it was uneventful. It worked. Um, <laughs> didn't sound pretty, but when you throw anything into a net like that, that's you know six grand. It doesn't always sound pretty. So. Mark. So how many pilots uh, at UGS and how many in DNR? So DNR wide, I think we're somewhere around twenty pilots, and there are certified um, Part One Hundred Seven. Um, pilots within UGS we have six and currently because we have the most we're typically going kind of helping other divisions um, Dogum does the same they've well Tommy is the main one there but he's always out kind of helping other divisions to kind of get their programs up off the ground they, have a nice they do ha they do have a really nice drill so Tommy's now over at forestry fire and state land if you want did he bring his drone with him? No. That, that's unfortunate. <laughs> I, I do have a question about okay. for the geohazards guys. On that rock fall, did you happen to run a Chris model on it? You know, it's a pre-model by Federal Highway, just to see how the trajectory matched up with. This is the boulder yeah, the from Round Peak. Uh, no, we Guess didn't what have boulders? any uh, specific models. The model that was run, that was uh, from a student over in Switzerland. Yep. And, and he's the one that ran that model. We didn't have time or the patience to, to run it. Uh, you could probably still, you know, with all the data that you have from it, with those impacts, you could go and, and run the CRISP model to see how it does. And because the main thing was the rock that was shown second, is there any more to come? It was rather flat, and in CRISP, you can put in your dimensions of your boulder. A flat rock doesn't roll the same as a round rock does. Yeah, that rock there, you think it's going to go a long distance, but it, it doesn't keep going. Yeah. And Chris model captures that. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's something we'd like to look into and uh, explore. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's free because it's an FHWA product. Okay. Cool. Thanks. So how how long will the <laughs> how long will a fixed wing, wing stay in the air and how long will a quadcopter stay if you heard you guys? Um, so the two that we've been working with, the quad will stay in the air for 20, 25 minutes. Um, the fixed wing, if it's not well with the multi-spectral cam, it's a, probably about twenty-five minutes, but it has a much higher payload. Without that, sort of the stock specifications with same battery that we use to modify you get over an hour of flight time so you could put a smaller camera on there or a smaller sensor and fly for an hour we've been talking about getting a little lidar unit yes cool. there is lidar in the future for ugs <laughs> mark have we had any issues with access and being able to fly anywhere <laughs> no we haven't had any issues with access and I think that's because it all starts back at the planning phase we make sure that that's airspace that we're allowed to fly in and not run into any issues and on top of that we also make sure that even if it is you know federal airspace that we're allowed to fly in we want to make sure that you know there could be private property around there we want to make sure that we're not hovering over these you know residential or businesses so that we're not raising suspicion because I think there still needs to be sort of a, an expectation of privacy. Um, so. Nobody's come out with a shotgun and gone just keep shooting. Yeah. You, you want not yet. <laughs> no, we are we try to avoid that as best as we, we can. We want you in a base, let me know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get uh, Christian another round of applause. Next month, we'll. Simon Jowett, Jowett? from the University of Nevada talking about critical minerals. Oh, cool. So it should be a great presentation. Okay. Thanks, cool. Christian. Yeah.